Let me say this, and I want to say it absolutely clearly. I was wrong. I was unfaithful. I have behaved badly sometimes. I have exchanged messages and photos of an explicit nature. I had affairs. I have acted in a way that violates my obligations to my family. I was unfaithful to my wife. I cheated. Tiger Woods. It was kind of like what people think porn sets are like. Elliot Spitzer. This was somebody who was vehemently anti-prostitution and he was indulging in it. Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was able to conceal a love child in his own home. Jesse James. It was on the couch, on the chair, on the computer desk. It was really hot. John Edwards. It was not only an affair on his ailing sick wife, but an affair on the public. Anthony Weiner. He shouldn't have been sending naked photos of himself to anybody. The same men who've scaled the highest ladders of success keep succumbing to the allure of infidelity. Technology creates an illusion of privacy. I think athletes and celebrities should just stay offline, and politicians too. The details vary, but the million dollar question remains. Why do powerful men risk it all for extramarital affairs? It just seems we recover from one cheating scandal and we're on to the next. The list is almost endless. Is it a cocktail of ego and opportunity? Ego does get in the way of reason. I felt I was entitled. People are attracted. Or does a deeper biological link exist between power and infidelity? A lot of people have begun to call this the cheating gene. There's clearly some genetic predisposition. We have to be careful in the conclusions we come to uh, because we don't know people's individual biologies. Of all the theories and all the possible explanations for the motivation behind cheating, I think the number one cause is power. Powerful men are sexy. Power is an aphrodisiac to the male mind. <laughs> I did not have sexual relations with that woman. In January of 1998, President Bill Clinton publicly denied allegations of a sexual relationship with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. He made the country believe that this was a ridiculous accusation. Four months and one federal investigation later, he came clean. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. People in power cheat. We've always known that people do that. The only thing that's changed is that the media has really exposed them. With movers and shakers getting caught with their pants down at an unprecedented rate, the public can't help but wonder, why do powerful men cheat? There are no species that are sexually monogamous for life. It's the thrill value. Constant temptation women throwing themselves at them. When you're a sports star or an actor, everybody expects it, but all the men who are in politics are the ones who distress me the most. That sex drive just grabs them, and that's it. Their judgment goes out the window. Elliot Spitzer, his stunning fall from grace linked to an alleged prostitution ring. From those to whom much is given, much is expected. I am deeply sorry that I did not live up to what was expected of me. From the beginning, Elliot Spitzer's was a life marked by high expectations. Elliot Spitzer was born in the Bronx, the youngest of three children. During family dinners, they were expected to talk about current events, they were expected to know about politics, and they were expected to be successful. Elliot Spitzer had a terrific education. He went to the Ivy League School of Princeton, then he went to Harvard Law School, where he met his future wife, Silda. After law school, Elliot and Silda moved to New York City, where they both worked for very prestigious law firms. The couple married in 1987. Two years later, Silda gave birth to their first ever three daughters. Shortly after that, Silda decided to give up her career as a lawyer. She said that she wanted to focus on her family. Elliot, on the other hand, continued his legal ascent, moving between the private sector and the public sphere before becoming New York State Attorney General in 1998. He was dubbed the Sheriff of Wall Street. He said he was standing up for the little investor, and so he went after a lot of the very big names and corporations. He seemed to really care about the common man, his constituents. But this crusader's choice causes would eventually lead to his own undoing. In 2003, he brought a suit against a Queens company that was promoting sexual trips to faraway places. A year later, his bust of a New York prostitution ring led to the arrests of 18 offenders was a fairly big progression in his fight against prostitution, which at that point he had pursued pretty heavily. Spitzer's political career was on the rise, 
and in November 2006, he was elected governor of the state of New York. What a wonderful night this has been across this nation for people who value good values and judgment. Spitzer was pretty well liked as the New York governor. He really had the most perfect public image that I don't think anybody could really see crashing and burning the way that it did. But crash and burn it would, and it all started in the fall of 2007 with a bank transaction. He called a vice president at North Fork Bank and asked if his name had to be attached to a money transfer. It was a $10,000 transfer, and it sounded a little suspicious. And that's when the FBI got involved. They were investigating into it to see if there were somehow bribes involved with Spitzer's administration. The wiretap led the FBI to a conversation in which Elliot Spitzer had called the Emperor's Club VIP on February 13th, 2008, in which he hired a call girl to come to the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. They found out that Spitzer was carrying on with a high-end hooker named Ashley Dupree. Emperor's Club VIP was an international escort agency, and Dupree, who went by Kristen, one of its call girls. The Mayflower incident with Ashley Dupree turned out not to be an isolated incident. Reportedly, Spitzer had been using prostitutes since he was attorney general, and he had spent up to $80,000 on prostitutes through the years. This was a man who was so against prostitution, and yet was dabbling in it on the side. On March 10th, 2008, Silda stood by her husband's side as he apologized publicly. I have acted in a way that violates my obligations to my family, and that violates my or any sense of right and wrong. He was doing the right thing by admitting to hypocrisy, wrongdoing, and uh, two days later he stepped down. The public reveled in the contrast between Spitzer's highbrow wife and lowbrow lover. But what struck most as inexplicable is readily explained by psychoanalysts. Spitzer is definitely a textbook example of a guy who has fallen into the Madonna whore complex. The Madonna in the Madonna whore complex refers to the man's idealized version of his mother. I'm Madonna the rock star, but Madonna the Virgin Mary, the pure woman who becomes the wife and the mother, particularly, of the children. He sees her as virtuous and pure, so much so that the idea of having sex with her is, like, unthinkable. The man splits women into the good woman in the kitchen, the mother figure, and the bad girl. The idea of the whore is also going to depend on what his idea of whore is. It's not necessarily literally a prostitute. It's just what he envisions as someone that is not wholesome or is naughty or is dirty. And so he needs two women to fulfill those separate roles. The seeds of the Madonna whore complex are planted early in life. Elliot's upbringing was not a warm and fuzzy one. He's admitted it himself. It was one based on success and going to good schools and making something of yourself. That lack of emotion leads him, in a sense, psychologically to rebel and to want to have another life that is separate from the public life of when he has to show such good judgment. The impulses that characterize Madonna whore complex can lay dormant for years. They can get triggered at a time in life when the partner, the female partner, becomes more maternal in her roles and in her life. So conceivably, her leaving her career, being with kids, could have been the trigger if that's what's going on with him. Once the dust settled, the Spitzers re-emerged as a united front. They have attended marriage counseling, which is something that Silda was open about them doing. He's clearly a focused, newfound Elliot Spitzer who was really determined to make that family work. Yet not every marriage rocked by infidelity is able to reclaim its game. All that I have done, I am so sorry. I was unfaithful. I had affairs. I cheated. Tiger Woods didn't mince words in 2010. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior. He said he was sorry, he said all the right things, but it was just way too late. Less than three months had passed since allegations surfaced of the golfer's extramarital affairs. But in those three months, Woods had gone from revered to reviled. 
Tiger Woods had such a squeaky clean image. He was the guy on the Wheaties box. That's what makes what happened so scandalous. For almost 15 years, the only thing cleaner than Tiger's image was his impeccable game. He was raised almost to be this machine, this, this golf machine. It was a reputation engineered by Tiger's late father, Earl, but sustained by the golf prodigy himself. His father really pushed him from a very young age to get involved in golf and cultivated his skill and his sort of phenom status as a young child. And he really played a giant part in Tiger's life. The duo's persistence paid off. When Tiger Woods first went pro in the 90s, everybody wanted a piece of him and they paid him a lot of money. Because of the endorsements and being a professional golfer at so young, Tiger Woods didn't really get to go out and party and be a wild child in his 20s like a lot of people. He really had to be buttoned up and very wholesome. It was an image upheld by Swedish model Elin Nordegren, who Tiger married in 2004. Elon was this sort of picture of European supermodel perfection. She did seem like the perfect fit for Tiger Woods. A daughter, Sam, was born in 2007, followed by a son, Charlie, in 2009. The impression of this beautiful family was that nothing could go wrong. They were living the American dream. The other impression of this couple was that they were a little bit boring. They were both very private people. I mean, clearly, Tiger was very good at hiding things. The number of mistresses varies, according to reports. But the scandal indisputably started in 2009 with three crucial digits, 911. Nine one one. I need an ambulance immediately. I have someone down in front of my house. They hit a pole. This was the first piece of the puzzle to crack, and what followed shocked everybody. Conflicting reports included one in which Elon angrily chased Tiger with a golf club, leading to the accident. What Elon was allegedly responding to was a tabloid report that Tiger had been having an affair with Rachel Yucatel. Rachel, you could tell, was mistress number one, and she was a sort of high-profile VIP cocktail waitress, more or less, at a club in New York. Following the accident, reporters started to jump on this story, and then women started to come forward talking about their affairs with Tiger. Veronica Daniels, an adult film star and dancer, was one of them. You know, he had come to the nightclub I was working at inside the Bellagio. He had, like, this... You know, it was pretty much called Tiger Stable. And everybody at the club was like, yeah, he really wants to meet you. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I pretty much knew what was going to happen. The couple went back to Tiger's suite. It was kind of like what people think porn sets are like. I was just like, wow. For like a good, good few minutes, I had no conscience whatsoever. I wasn't thinking about anything except for how good it felt. I think that what's really interesting is how many of his mistresses thought that they were the only one. We started having feelings for each other and the whole I love you and you know going to bed in the, you know going to bed in the same bed, waking up, holding each other, having breakfast, just like that stuff that you do when you're a couple. Tiger didn't keep the details of his marriage from Daniels. Yeah, there'd be times where he'd be on the phone with her and I'd be laying right next to him. Their affair continued for four years until that November day in 2009 when the lid came off of Tiger's secret. The world's best golfer and possibly the most famous athlete on the planet out of the hospital tonight after a car crash early this morning. Oh my God, this is happening. It's happening now and it's happening big. More women have stepped forward saying they have had affairs with the world's top golfer. Every day there was a new one. I've never seen the tap drip for this long without somebody stopping it. I'm like, please don't say my name. Please don't say my name. I said my name. I just wanted to die. I wanted to die. The public scrambled for an explanation of how Tiger could have maintained such a prolific sex life without getting caught. A research study conducted in Stockholm in 2008 potentially provides the answer. There's a very particular gene that about 40% of men actually have. The presence of allele 334, dubbed the cheating gene, often indicates a propensity toward discord within a relationship. There is a cheating gene. A certain percentage of men have this one gene that says, I find it hard to bond with a woman, I'm going to look for more women. But that doesn't mean that the person's automatically going to cheat. They're simply predisposed to it. Alleles are versions of genes responsible for determining traits. Men who have 
one copy of this allele or this genetic variation or two copies of this allele or genetic variation tend to express less strong pair bonding ability. According to a high school girlfriend, Tiger's father Earl had his share of extramarital affairs, behavior that allegedly distressed his son. A great many children of alcoholics are terribly upset as children and as teenagers and vow that they will never drink and then do turn into alcoholics themselves. So it's not altogether surprising that a father who had the biological propensity to be adulterous would uh, create a son who has the same. It's interesting that these cheating powerful men usually come from cheating powerful fathers. It's an explanation that provided little solace for Tiger's fans. Tiger's game has been dreadful since this scandal broke. A lot of people thought his personal life would change. Very few people thought his professional life was changed. How wrong they have been. And Tiger wasn't the only figure whose clandestine actions did a number on his game. I have no idea who that baby is. I honestly have no idea. I was wrong, and I am responsible. When one-time presidential hopeful John Edwards admitted to an affair with his campaign documentarian, it was a glaring blemish on a life otherwise blanketed in success. John Edwards was a man who was successful in practically everything he did. I grew up as a small-town boy in North Carolina, you know, came from nothing, worked very hard. Married in 1977 to fellow law student Elizabeth Ananiah, John and his wife settled down in North Carolina, where they soon had two young children, and where John quickly made a name for himself. I became a lawyer. Through a lot of work and success, I got some acclaim as a lawyer. But no amount of success could avert the tragedy that struck in 1996, when the couple's teenage son, Wade, was killed in an auto accident. I think that and his work with patients and on personal injury really pushed him into politics. Soon after, Edwards quit his law career to pursue a seat in the Senate, where he served for six years. In 2003, he announced he was throwing his hat into the presidential ring. A lot of people really liked John Edwards. He had a beautiful family. He had his long-term wife, Elizabeth, who was totally supportive, who campaigned with him and was, by some accounts, the mastermind behind his success. A lot of people thought he had a kind of Kennedy-esque charm about him. They thought he was going to be the new face of the Democratic Party. In 2004, he had done so well in the primaries that John Kerry put him on his ticket as a vice presidential candidate. In a close election, Kerry and Edwards lost the bid to their opponents. George Bush won the election, and John Edwards was back to life as normal. Except normalcy would never return to the Edwards home. The day after the defeat, the couple announced that Elizabeth Edwards had cancer. She encouraged her husband to pursue the 2008 presidential nomination regardless. It was on the campaign trail in 2006 that Edwards met Rial Hunter at a New York City bar. In a move that raised eyebrows, he hired her to document his campaign. She didn't have much of a production background, which makes us question why exactly Rial Hunter was hired. It might not have had to do with her camera skills. He was just very random, like why was this random woman following him around, filming him all the time? The writing on the wall began to materialize in late 2007, when the National Enquirer ran a story claiming Edwards had been having an affair with an unnamed woman. John Edwards, of course, denied this up and down to the heavens. Two months later, they ran a picture of Riel Hunter pregnant, and it couldn't have pleased John Edwards, who was trying to forget about this whole thing. And when the Enquirer printed photos of Edwards holding an infant during a visit with Hunter in August of 2008, he had little choice but to confess, to some degree, in 2006, told Elizabeth about the mistake. He finally went on Nightline and admitted that he had an affair with Riel Hunter, uh, but he didn't claim that the baby was his. I have no idea who that baby is. I honestly have no idea. Campaign manager Andrew Young, married with a family of his own, released a statement through his attorney claiming paternity of the child. He was the most bizarre story. Like, couldn't they come up with something better than that? I mean, it just screamed that it was a lie. Questions about Edwards' finances were also on the table. Has anyone affiliated with your presidential campaign provided any financial help to Ryle Hunter or Andrew Young? I, I, I have no idea what you're asking about. 
Those questions would ultimately be the linchpin in extracting the long overdue truth from Edwards and his entourage. The Justice Department may be ready to file charges against former Senator John Edwards for allegedly using campaign money to hide his mistress. Andrew Young eventually changed his tune and admitted that John Edwards fathered the baby because they were subpoenaed for mishandling campaign funds and he didn't want to lie to the court. With that, Edwards released a statement in early 2010 admitting paternity of Francis Quinn Hunter. That baby had John Edwards' face. She was a mini-me. John and Elizabeth Edwards legally separated, and one week before her death in December of 2010, she cut him from her will. There's no way she wanted one cent of her money going to that man who had so betrayed her. Experts speculate that Edwards' ego is likely the thing that hijacked his personal life and political promise. The very things that you need in order to be hugely successful is a healthy ego, a huge degree of narcissism, an ability to take the dings and shots that come at you, and an ability to take risks. Those are the same things that help you have affairs. An overinflated ego is first and foremost caused by the entourage that surrounds powerful people and celebrities. People were telling me, oh, he's such a, such a great person, such a great lawyer, such a talent. You're gonna go, no telling what you'll do. And this was when I was 30, 31 years old. All of which fed a self-focus, an egotism, a narcissism that leads you to believe that, that you can do whatever you want. Ego's not quantifiable. There's no real test we can say, oh, you have a healthy ego, we have an unhealthy ego. We can only sort of look at the way you act and the way you behave and say, your ego's become unhealthy because it's destroying your life or destroying the life of the people around you. I became, at least on the outside, something different than that young boy who grew up in a small town in North Carolina. And because that young boy would never have done this, never thought about doing it. In the case of USA versus Johnny Reed Edwards, he faces up to 30 years in prison for charges including conspiracy, false statements, and acceptance of illegal campaign contributions. John Edwards' reputation will never recover. Once we find out who this man really was, he's unelectable. I think what will most be remembered sadly about John Edwards is that he cheated on his wife who had cancer. We're going to forget all about the work he did as a lawyer, his work in Congress, his work on the presidential campaign, because he made this monumental mistake. Politicians, uh, particularly when they're based in Washington, they're part of a bubble. And when that bubble bursts, media scrutiny awaits. I'm not going to talk about this anymore. I'm going to get back to the conversation I care about. You vote yes if you believe yes. You vote in favor of something if you believe it's the right thing. New York Congressman Anthony Weiner seemed to have it all. A flair for politics. I will not yield to the gentleman, and the gentleman will observe regular order. The gentleman will observe regular order. A sense of humor. It is true it's difficult having this name. It is simply in my neighborhood not easy to be named Anthony. And a bright future. Anthony Weiner certainly had a good shot of becoming mayor. He'd already raised about $4 million for the campaign. Anthony Weiner seemed to know from a young age that he wanted to be a big shot in politics, and he did whatever he had to do to get there. In 1991, at the age of 27, he became the youngest councilman in New York City history. Seven years later, he earned a coveted seat in the House of Representatives. He was seen as somebody who was very aggressive for his constituents, very aggressive for the causes that he believed in. In July of 2010, Weiner married Huma Apadeen, an aide to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She's, you know, lovely and elegant and brilliant and widely respected throughout this town, so obviously opposites attract. His words would prove all too ironic. On May 28, 2011, Weiner used the social networking website Twitter to send a photo to a college student in Seattle. He first tweeted a picture of his underwear clad in other regions to a woman thinking he was sending it to her privately, but it really went out publicly. And as soon as he realized his mistake, he deleted it from Twitter. Weiner's office released a statement saying the congressman's Twitter account had been hacked, but he was the victim of a prank. This is a prank, uh, not a terribly creative one. Over the weekend, Weiner himself tweeted this. TiVo shot, FB hacked. Is my blender gonna attack me next? Anthony Weiner chose to kind of laugh it off. Conservative watchdog Andrew Breitbart refused to let the story die, and the questions kept coming. I am not gonna permit 
myself to be distracted by this issue any longer. All you, you have are to do free. is say no to that question. You are free. You're very good if at... You're not I, following you, her on Twitter. Well, say no why, to the why question. Don't you, why don't you let me do the answers and you do the questions? As soon as you answer the question and ask her, sir, we will. He was angered and annoyed by the persistence of the press. I'd love to get an answer. That, that, that would be reasonable, right? You do the questions. That would be reasonable. You do the questions. I do the answers in this interrupts me? How about that as the, as the new rule of the game? They don't want to talk about some boring government thing. They want to talk about his penis on Twitter. And when BigGovernment.com published shirtless photos that Wiener had purportedly sent to a second woman, the congressman was forced to lie down in the bed he'd made. Over the past few years, I have engaged in several inappropriate conversations conducted over Twitter, Facebook, email, and occasionally on the phone with women I had met online. He had gotten married less than a year before the scandal broke, so it was really strange that this man who had just been married is flirting with women on the internet. Is it technically cheating? I guess it depends on how you define cheating, but it's crossing lines that can definitely lead you in that direction. And it is a relationship. There's a person at the other end of it. Two days after his public apology, an X-rated photo believed to be of Wiener surfaced online. Wiener did not deny that it was of him. The instant that I saw the nude photo, there was no way that he could continue his career. On the same day, the media caught wind of news that Wiener's wife, Huma, was pregnant. Oh, God, like the poor lady. You know, him sending pictures out while his wife's pregnant, it just makes it like that much worse. There were calls for his resignation, even among fellow Democrats, pressure mounted for Wiener to step down. I think that was really one of the things that made him eventually throw in the towel. So today I am announcing my resignation from Congress. Yeah! Bye -bye, pervert! Wiener and Appadine say they'll remain together. She's been photographed with him. She's even been seen holding his hand. She has stayed with him. That is her most public statement. If Anthony Weiner is committed to being a good husband and a good father, and his wife has chosen to forgive him, and they're entering into this new phase together, perhaps they can use this as a milestone um, to, to grow in the right direction. As the couple works out their future, experts work out theories as to what caused Weiner's indiscretions. Like many congressmen, Anthony Weiner had to travel a lot. His constituents were here in New York, so he needed to be in New York. And yet, when Congress is in session, he needed to be in Washington. At the same time, Huma was often seen at Hillary Clinton's side, traveling the globe on State Department business. He didn't have a seven-day-a-week, 52-week-a-year living arrangement with his wife. Creating this kind of distance can be very dangerous for marriages. Physical proximity, especially for men, is necessary for the body's release of oxytocin, the so-called love hormone. Oxytocin motivates bonding, so it makes us want to be together with our spouses, with our children. So the more you're with somebody, the more it feels good to be with them. So oxytocin is like a muscle. This monogamy molecule needs to be exercised. When you don't do that, then the relationship tends to fall apart. In men, oxytocin is in direct competition with testosterone. Testosterone motivates men to take risk. Now add that on to men who are off doing a project for three months somewhere and they're not exercising that monogamy muscle, not releasing oxytocin when they see their wife or children, and you have a recipe for disaster. They get lonely and they feel entitled to uh, fulfill their emotional as well as their sexual needs. So a man isn't even aware that he's feeling lonely. He just knows to go on Facebook or Twitter and find some accolades from some unknown female will help him feel better. But relationships that begin online oh, I sent just a random friend request can bring consequences that are anything but virtual. I said, aren't you married? I questioned, did I win it or did I just wear everyone down? In March of 2010, actress Sandra Bullock took home Hollywood's most esteemed honor. Sandra Bullock finally stopped being the B-list Julia Roberts. Sandra Bullock became the biggest star in the world. She and husband Jesse James shared an intimate exchange before she walked on stage to accept her statue. I'd never divulge what Jesse said unless he divulged it first. Hollywood's sweetheart would soon find out that her mogul husband had been bringing home prizes of his own. I turned on the TV and there he was. And I was like, oh my God, I was sleeping with this guy and he's making this lady look like a complete idiot. Ten days after Sandra's heartfelt acceptance speech, In Touch magazine dropped a bomb, almost literally. Tattoo model Michelle Bombshell McGee 
claimed she had an ongoing affair with Bullock's reality star husband. She not only told them she was having an affair with Jesse, she had evidence. She gave them emails, text messages. He was caught. It was everything Sandra's fans and loved ones had feared when she began dating the tattooed biker six years earlier. The fact that these two got together was really, really surprising. Yet, where status is concerned, the couple had more in common than meets the eye. In 1992, Jesse James started this motorcycle customization business out of a friend's garage in California. And slowly but surely, he started to develop a celebrity cult following, including Keanu Reeves and Shaquille O'Neal. He was then given a show on the Discovery Channel after a special was aired and gained tremendous popularity for him called Monster Garage. He developed a tremendous cult following for Discovery. It is an empire worth over $200 million. He has estimated himself to be worth over $100 million. And he became a celebrity, a mega celebrity, actually, because he really came up during the rising age of reality and became huge through that avenue. The couple exchanged vows in 2005, with one partner taking them more seriously than the other. I wanted to model for his company, West Coast Shoppers, and so I sent just a random friend request, and he responded right back with a personal message. His response was, hey, it's me, Jesse. I'm like, no. Yeah, right, fine. I thought it was an assistant or somebody. And he goes, no, it's, it's me, Jesse. Here's my phone number. Give me a call. Well, I drove up to Long Beach, and I was really shocked when he opened up the gate, and it was really him. The modeling gig never panned out, but Bombshell McGee did receive some unexpected benefits. We just kind of sat there and just talked for about two hours. He said, well, do you want to watch a movie? And he kind of patted it next to him and said, come sit with me. And then he did like the whole 14-year-old thing and put his arm around me and tried to kiss me. And that's when I stopped him and asked him about Sandra. Sandra was on location in Austin, Texas, shooting The Blind Side. I said, aren't you married? And he's like, well, that's really none of your business. I'm separated. We don't live together. We're getting a divorce. And I don't want you to ask anything else about it. This turns out to be complete rubbish, and a simple Google search would have proven that true. For McGee, Jesse's word was sufficient. Sex would happen on the couch, on the chair, on the computer desk. It was really hot. James allegedly shared marital woes with his mistress. He made comments about her sleeping with too many dogs in the bed. So I think they were lacking some kind of a connection. But Jesse James' infidelity might have less to do with what's in his bed and more to do with what's in his own body. Jesse James is a classic example of a high testosterone male. He's muscular, he has a receding hairline. So these are the kind of physical markers that tell us who has high testosterone. High testosterone males are much more promiscuous. Testosterone, the hormone associated with drive, risk-taking, and sex, might have hijacked Jesse James' commitment to monogamy. If a man has an affair, it doesn't necessarily mean that his current relationship is not fulfilling, not of high quality. We tend to say, oh, well, there must have been a problem in the relationship, therefore he strayed. But you actually might be able to have it both ways biologically. You might have the affair, have this motivation to have a new sexual partner, but at the same time, truly love your wife and family. Many men possess high levels of testosterone, but unlike Jesse James, their levels aren't elevated by celebrities' constant stroke. There's an extra wrinkle, which is your social status also affects your testosterone levels. And so if they were born to have high testosterone and then have great social status, you have this sort of double whammy where they're really out there prowling for the next opportunity. In an interview with ABC's Nightline, James offered up his own explanation for his cheating ways. You know, I was petrified of my dad. Football star, bike builder, TV star. All that stuff is a huge smoke screen so people won't see that I'm a scared, abused kid. He tried to use it as a crutch to say, well, here's what happened to me as a child. I'm sorry I'm a little screwed up in the head right now. The explanation is more plausible than some might think. So if you haven't been nurtured as a child up to about age 10, it's less likely that your attachment system will work well. So Jesse James, who said he was abused as a child by his father, it's likely that his system for oxytocin release is not working properly. Oxytocin is the hormone that encourages monogamy and connection. If childhood abuse hindered Jesse James' oxytocin release, the damage would materialize in his relationships. So it's going to be more difficult for him to form relationships. At the same time, he has high testosterone. So kind of not surprising you see him have an affair. In addition to undoing his marriage, Jesse's behavior cost him another relationship. So one month after the entire cheating scandal broke, 
It was revealed that the entire time this was happening, Sandra Bullock and Jesse James had been engaged in adoption proceedings. Bullock continued with the adoption on her own. Jesse, meanwhile, moved on to an off and on again relationship with fellow reality star Kat Von D. He had to restore his image as quote unquote, Jesse James the bad boy. But restoring an image in the wake of infidelity is easier for motorcycle moguls than it is for politicians. And he will never, ever run for elected office in this country again. I have behaved badly sometimes. Yes, it is true. Arnold Schwarzenegger fesses up about a secret love child. According to the LA Times, the former governor has a 10-year-old child, and the mother is not Maria Shriver. In 2011, Arnold Schwarzenegger shocked the world with news that he'd fathered a child with a member of his household staff. When people found out that Arnold had had a child with the housekeeper Patty, what shocked them the most was not necessarily Arnold had not been faithful, but the fact that he was having sex with the woman that made his bed every day. Austrian-born Schwarzenegger went from portraying himself in 1977's documentary, Pumping Iron, to arriving full force on the big screen in 1982, playing the title role in the runaway hit Conan the Barbarian. He seems a very unlikely person to make it as a movie star in America. However, he proved us all wrong. It wasn't long before Arnold's star and his reputation as a ladies' man were on the rise. He has a long history of womanizing. In the early 70s, he made a comment that was published in Wee Magazine that he had participated in orgies. So he was not only into women, but he was into multiple women at the same time. More surprising than Arnold's decision to settle down in 1986 was the pedigree of his off-screen leading lady. For him to marry into the Kennedys, to marry Maria Shriver, uh, I think it pretty much stunned the world. Maria is a Kennedy. This woman has the Democratic blanket wrapped around her so many times. And Arnold is a Republican and certainly very proud to be one too. Political differences seemed surmountable for the couple who went on to have four children. And in 2003, Arnold announced his candidacy for governor of California. It was a move that would catapult his legacy to new heights at a price. When you run for office, that is when the spotlight shines on you. You want to see a real bright spotlight run for governor or president. In what was dubbed Gropegate, the Los Angeles Times printed allegations by six women of sexual misconduct by Schwarzenegger, extending back as far as 30 years. And isn't it odd that, that three days and four days before the campaign, all of a sudden all these women want to have an apology? Isn't it odd? Charges from the women were settled or dropped, and the Terminator, dubbed the Governator, became the first foreign-born governor of the Golden State. Among his first orders of business was a public expression of gratitude toward his wife. I want to thank her so much for being the greatest wife and the most spectacular partner. And I know how many votes I got today because of you. It just seemed like this storybook marriage between the biggest movie star, arguably of all time, and a family member from the most famous political family of all time. That changed on May 9th, 2011 when Schwarzenegger and Shriver released a statement announcing their decision to separate. This took everybody by surprise. However, what followed in the next couple of weeks was shocking. The Los Angeles Times broke probably the biggest scandal about Arnold Schwarzenegger of all time. And that was that he had had an illicit affair with his housekeeper, Mildred Patty Bania. And as a result of that sexual congress, if you will, she bore his child, uh, who is now 14 years old. Having an affair with somebody who's in your own house, under your own roof, and uh, ending up with a child who may or may not look like you, who's in the house on occasion. To me, that's about like the ultimate risk taking. She was pregnant with this child when Maria was pregnant with Christopher which makes you wonder, were Maria and uh, Patty Bania sharing maternity tips? I was shocked, I was absolutely surprised. Less shocked are those who study the behavior of thrill seekers. The type T personality 
The T stands for thrill-seeking. Lex Arnold's a, a sort of a, a textbook T-type. He came from nowhere. He's a bodybuilder in Graz, Austria. Now, what's the likelihood that he's going to rise to become a, a famous movie star in Hollywood, USA? He had goals in mind, and they were grand goals. Often these people take risks to get ahead. And what's more challenging than another woman? Or having a secret and getting away with it? I think in particular political life is very challenging for type T men. They need to have the ambition, the risk taking, to be able to get to where they are. But at the same time, they are now scrutinized by a populace who votes for them. A study conducted at the University of Binghamton provides a biological theory. The GRD4 gene, like most genes, actually has two alleles. Um, and uh, so we each, we get one from our mother and one from our father. An allele is a gene form that determines a person's traits. Some of us have longer alleles than others. And if at least one of them has more than seven repeats, so it's a really long allele, um, folk, those folks are more inclined to engage in risk-taking behavior. Um, so we consider them a, a genetic risk-taker. According to experts, Genetic risk takers require a larger amount of dopamine to feel satisfied. Dopamine is a neurohormone released during pleasurable or thrilling activities, such as skydiving, eating, or sex. And folks with the long allele actually don't get the same rush. They need more intense stimuli, more intense behavior to get that same pleasure response in the brain. The DRD4 study does show that there is a proportion of men who have a propensity towards one-night stands, hookups, uncommitted sexual relationships. I think we have to be careful um, to not diagnose people because we don't know people's individual biologies. But certainly we can look at someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger and we can say, here's a man who likes his dopamine thrills. I'm not a therapist, far be it from that, but Arnold Schwarzenegger is either completely insane or he's an absolute thrill seeker. Within days of the discovery of his adultery, he was talking about what he was going to do next. With several projects in the works, Arnold's banking on his ability to connect once again with audiences. He will no doubt continue to be a very high paid actor in Hollywood. He'll get on the couch with Jay Leno and he'll find a way to joke about everything that's happened up until now. T-types tend to, in my view, bounce back well. We haven't heard the last of Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's for damn sure. We also haven't heard the last of infidelity, whether stemming from internal or external factors. Cheating among powerful men has proven more evergreen than seasonal. It's been happening since the beginning of man and continues on. So even though religions and governments have tried to outlaw infidelity, it's not going to disappear. We think fame is a wonderful commodity, but looking at all the people who actually embrace fame, there's two sides to it, and I think puts extreme stress on relationships. Power leads to increased opportunity, constant temptation, narcissism, ego, and instant gratification. Power had really did destroy their perception of the world. They felt that they could control everything. The fact that they were having affairs, that somehow they could control it and keep it secret. They were incredibly out of touch, all of them.